Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are at. Hello, everyone. Uh, my apologies. I am just a few minutes late. Uh, welcome, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, depending on where you are tuning in from. I'm actually just opening this up so that I can be sure that I can um, see everybody's comments as you are jumping on. Today we are going to have some conversation around how um, to understand or explore the uh, four personalities you might encounter if you are trying to take your message into larger spaces, especially corporate. And so I just really want to give you that moment. I'm actually just let me get this all set up here so that I can see you all. And um, oops, let me get in so I can see who's showing up and um, we can have some conversations. So hello, hello, everyone. Okay, now I got that. I can, ooh, I'm having issues this morning. So, all right, if you are joining, please uh, drop a note in the comment. Let me know you are here. Um, we are, again, like I said, now that I've got everything set up and I can get my brain situated, first of all, apologies for being just a few minutes late. Um, I did want to talk about the four personalities that you might encounter as you are starting to take your message into larger spaces. And so as we are talking about, you know, as light workers, as leaders, as individuals who have an opportunity right now to serve, and I will tell you the more and more um, I look at what's going on and the more and more I sit within uh, my own energy and, and things that are that are showing up, I continue to get downloads around why this is such a good time, why this is a, a powerful um, opportunity to be taking your message in. And I will tell you, um, the conversations that I'm having, there is such a need for real connection. There is such a need for um, real leadership for heart-centered messages that are allowing people to be more vulnerable, to be more connected, um, to be able to serve in a different capacity. And so um, as I think about, you know, those of us in this community and I think about others that are out there that are leaders and light workers and healers, um, just really powerful about why we need to be in this space right now and, and what's going on. So let's talk about some of the personalities because as you all know, um, corporate has a reputation for a reason and some of those larger organizations because there is an energy, there is a, a mentality, there are these personalities that show up. And so what I want to do is I want to highlight four that tend to be most prevalent. And if you are showing up, hello, hello, uh, say, drop a hello in the comments, say that you're here. If you watch the replay, replay later, uh, drop a replay in so that I can come back and know um, if there are questions or comments um, that I can uh, make sure I'm addressing those. So um, I can't always see who's here until you comment. Um, I do see several have jumped on, so welcome everyone. Uh, so let's talk about those four, four personalities. Um, they can be pretty um, strong if you're not prepared for them. And so I'm gonna kind of walk you backwards to my favorite <laughs> personality to work with. And so the first personality that shows up um, in corporate in particular, but in business in general, uh, especially for larger organizations, uh, is really what I will call the overconfident egomaniac. So I have personally given them these kind of qualifiers or labels, but what you get is you get the overconfident egomaniac. This is the individual in an organization that pretty much likes to puff their chest up. They're the person that thinks everything, the sun sets and shines because of them, rises and, and, and sets, right? Um, this is the person that can be very overconfident in terms of what they think is going on in their culture or their organization, and they're really very far removed from it. And so they tend to be very type A, extreme type A personalities. They tend to be hard driving, all about the bottom line. It's all about what makes them look good. And so when we understand that, there's an opportunity and tactic or strategy on how you engage with them. And I'll give you an example. I had an opportunity where I was, um, there was a recommendation or a referral made on my behalf uh, to the CEO of a very large manufacturing company. And um, 
uh, this person had actually gone through some of my coaching programs and had been certified as a coach through me. Um, and she was the former CFO uh, for that business and was very clear that their CEO needed an executive coach and that they needed to be looking at leadership in their organization. So she had said she wanted to connect the two of us together, which I was like, great. Well, I was coming back from, and I'm going to be really direct on how this conversation went. So I'm giving you a real example of the overconfident kind of egomaniac um, personality that shows up. That is very, especially when you're working with upper level leaders and the C-suite, this is an energy that is still very prevalent um, in this space. And so I was driving from Houston to Austin, back to Austin at that time. And I remember going, oh crap, I've got that phone call. And I have to say, I wasn't as prepared as I usually am going into those calls. I was like, oh, shoot, who's that CEO? What company is he the CEO for? What? And, but however, I know how to show up on a call and have these conversations. So I get on the call and I am not kidding, for 20 minutes, 20 minutes straight, this individual, who again was the CEO of this, this large company, um, started spouting about how awesome his organization was, how awesome he was as, as a leader, what was going on, how everything was great, to the point where he was just going on and on and on and on and on that I legitimately had a thought in my head that was like, I honestly could be listening to an audiobook right now. This is wasting my time. And I would be much rather be listening to an audiobook on the two and a half hour drive from Houston back to Austin than listening to this nonsense right now. So I was already getting a little like irritated by this because he really did feel like he was wasting my time. To which all of that went on, he ended at 20 minutes and said, so what are you gonna do for me anyway? Gotta say that completely, hey Sharon, that just like took me over the edge. And I will tell you that this is one of the things I've learned, especially being a female. I would say that a man probably cannot do the same thing in quite the same, same perspective um, because they might be seen as a threat. And I'll talk about that more. And, and for those of you that are interested, as I talk about, you know, launching the incubator next month and how we work through these examples and work through opportunities, I would actually dive into this deeper to show you um, how you would structure that and what you would want to do. But what happened in this situation, just to give you the example, was he was just all like, so what are you going to do for me anyway? And I remember I just... In the moment, I was very present and I said, first and foremost, I'm going to call your bullshit. Long pause, got very quiet and he said, excuse me, what? And I said, I'm going to call your bullshit. And I let him kind of digest that for a minute because part of me was like, I can't believe I just said that. And part of me was like, of course I just did. Because then I said, I'm curious and this is a great way to lean in and kind of disrupt that energy of that very ego, I got it all figured out, I know my stuff, I'm not about to get vulnerable, it's good, I'm overconfident, I just, I got it. Because that's, that's what they think, I got it. I don't need your help, I got it. Or I'm, I don't know how to ask for help, I'm not going to be vulnerable, whatever that might be. So I simply said to him, I said, I'm curious, first of all, I understand that so-and-so introduced us and, and appreciate the introduction. Hey, Kasba, and I'm curious, what prompted you to have this call? If you've got it all figured out, why are we having this call in the first place? Again, long pause. Second of all, and this is where I wanted to call this bullshit, I said, I heard you say this, and I heard you say this, and these two things don't add up. So how about you tell me what's really going on? Otherwise, I would suggest, and I did use some pretty strong language. I said, otherwise, I would suggest we end this call because you're, and I said, <laughs> but I was like, you're fucking wasting my time. I just put it out there. <laughs> he responded, and I'll never forget, he responded. He goes, so how do I work with you? <laughs> to which I said, I don't know yet that I want to work with you. I still don't know what's going on in your organization. I don't know what's really going on because you haven't told me anything to see whether it makes sense for us to work together. So let's just say the rest of the conversation, and we stayed on the phone almost my, a good portion of my drive back from Houston, Austin, where he started to let go of that ego and started to let me see behind the curtain. So it's kind of like in the Wizard of Oz when the, the great and powerful Oz is like, I'm the great and powerful Oz. And then you pull the curtain back and you see this little man back there who's just like shaking and nervous and all these things. When you understand that a lot of corporate 
especially, but large business companies, they have an energy that says, I have to be this force to be reckoned with. Because many of them, even though that personality shows up, they're actually a big teddy bear underneath. They just can't let, they've been taught that they can't let someone see that vulnerability, that they can't let someone see them feel weak or need help or ask for questions. And so they end up being in a space where they put on this good facade. And I know I did the same thing. I was really good at puffing my chest up in corporate. I got it. I don't need anyone's help. I, asking for help was weakness. Being vulnerable was weakness. These are the things that are conditioned and taught in those environments that when we ended up having a very real conversation, there was a lot that came, became uncovered. And one of it was there was a lack of trust within his executive leadership team. There were some sacred cows that maybe needed to be moved out. There was a lack of connection and real transparency between not only his C-suite leaders, but the rest of the leaders in his organization. And we started to uncover the challenges that were really present to which I did choose to take him on as a client. And we worked together for three years. Not only did I do executive level coaching for him directly, I also ended up working with his entire leadership team that we built out a way for me to engage and train and work on how we were gonna build deeper trust within his organization and in the culture. And it started because I recognized, and so when I say that, I am a little tongue in cheek, but this is the conversation that happened. It is absolutely the conversation I had with this, this CEO and my ability to push past that air of arrogance, that air of egomaniac, I got this, I'm good, to let that just be done and then say, and, and I will tell you one of the best strategies when you're working with that level of arrogance, because that arrogance comes from a deep place of insecurity. It comes from a lot of fear and it comes from a lot of conditioning. And like I said, usually when you can get inside of that, you actually will see that they're just tender, they're vulnerable, and they're just big old teddy bears. Because I'm gonna give you another example of this. I did a presentation in Dallas several years ago and it was for about 40 to 50 transitioning C-level executives. These were all people getting either moved out of their position, had lost their job, their company downside, whatever it was, they were in transition. And by the way, when you're in the C-suite, a lot of times there can be movement and transition and people move to different companies, whatever. So I've got about 50 of these leaders in the room and I'm doing what I do and one of, and we were talking about culture and transparency and you know, what culture feels like. And one of the former, and it was interesting because I even asked this group, I went around and said, I want you to tell me who you are. So each one was like, I'm the former COO of XYZ company. I'm the former CEO of ABC company. They went all around the room and I said, I go, interesting that I asked each one of you to tell me who you were and not one of you told me. Yet each one of you told me what you used to do because they are so identified by their title. The higher you climb in the corporate ladder, the more energy and, and, and like tethering they have to their identity based on the title and role they have. Again, this is the corporate, this is what's been taught, right? And so there's a lot of opportunity to break that down. Many of those executives don't have anyone else they feel they can talk to. It's why they like some of their, their um, peer, they need peer groups, they need round table, board, ways that they can, they can talk with other C-level executives because they can't talk to their team. It's irresponsible if they take that responsibility to vent downwards. So anyway, we're in this conversation and it was interesting because I had a COO who very arrogantly, very energetically was like, I just want you to know, I, I agree, Candy. I used to work at this organization, my last organization, you know, all this was going on and our culture sucked. Oh, I can't believe how bad our culture sucked. And it was this, and he's just going on and he's complaining and he's complaining. And I let him finish. And I said, and this is what I said in response. I said, well, shame on you. He said, excuse me. I love that. I get a lot of excuse me. And he said, um, I said, shame on you. I said, you were the chief operating officer and you're going to sit here and tell me that your culture was broken. Shame on you for not stepping up and leading what was possible in that space. And he just like stared at me and the rest of the room kind of got silent. At the end of the talk, he came up to me, which happens a ton when I have these conversations with that overconfident, arrogant, egomaniac personality. I will hear, 
You know, Candy, I have never, and I always can finish the sentence, I know you've never had anyone talk to you that way. My follow-up, and this is the most powerful bridge when you're dealing with these personalities. Now, some of them are narcissistic and you don't want to work with them, for sure. Some of them, this is just their mask. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to tell you. These personalities are masks. These people are very tender. They're very vulnerable. They really need help. They don't know how to ask. They think it's a weakness when they do. So it's a mask they, they wear and they puff up the chest and they create this arrogance that says, I'm good, I got it. When actually they're like what I like to say, and people used to say that all the time, they're like, man, can you get your shit together? I'm like, mm, I'm like a duck in water. What you see on top, I've learned how to condition and keep calm. Underwater, my legs are paddling like a mile a minute, and I'm hoping that no one figures out I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Every C-level executive I know has a little bit of that duck going on. They are sitting there going, holy shit, I am the person responsible for all of this. I gotta sound like I know what's doing. I just gotta make a decision. And I hope nobody knows that I'm actually freaking out. And there are days that I feel like a huge imposter and I don't know what to do with it. So I say that because I have a lot of love and, and respect and grace for some of those overconfident, arrogant egomaniacs, because I know it's just a mask for what is that duck that's going crazy underneath the water. And so my favorite bridge statement is whenever I get somebody that says, Candy, no one has ever talked to me that way, or I can't believe you just said that, or blah, 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 whatever they do. My response is, and this is a, a technique I'm giving you, is to say the word and and stop talking. I want you to recognize that when I say to someone, they're like, Candy, no one has ever talked to me. I'm like, yes, and, and then I just stop. Because that and implies, I hear you, and what are you going to do about it? I hear you and you're being triggered. So again, what are you gonna take responsibility for? I hear you and great, it's still not working for you. So now that we're done with the BS portion of this program, we can get to the brass tacks of what's really going on. Because it's only when you're willing, and this is where I do feel women have an edge over men. And this is something that I will teach for those of you that want to join the, the incubator and really get into this in a deeper level, because this is a really powerful technique. Women in particular can go toe to toe more and call this bullshit because right, wrong, or indifferent. And I don't, it's not right because it goes to all the inequity that plays out in business right now. I'm not seen as a threat. Most of my, my corporate people see me as their sister, their daughter, whatever. As much as, yes, there's something about that that kind of rubs me the wrong way, I also know I can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and get them vulnerable like that. I can create a container that feels safe. Hey, Dana, I can create a container that feels safe. A man sometimes feels like a threat or competition and has to come up with a different strategy, yet still can call that out. But here's the thing. Most executives are looking for someone to challenge them. It's why every executive needs a coach, needs a coach, if they're going to be successful. Because real leadership says, I only vent out and up. I never vent down, which means they can't share some of their deepest fears with their executive leadership team. They actually need a space to feel safe, to be able to like work through their stuff and not put it on their team. My client, this client that I told you about that I took on from that conversation from Houston to Austin, he told me at one point, he goes, I swear I pay you just to be my sounding board. And I said to him, I said, great, so what's that worth to you? He goes, at least a million bucks. And I looked at him, I go, we need to renegotiate my contract. He goes, I figured you were gonna say that. But what you don't understand is most of those executives need a safe space to land. And I'm going to say that again. Most of those executives need a safe space to land. They don't take it home to their family. They don't take it to their leadership team. They don't have people who have full capacity to be able to hold them in their fullness, meaning their fears, their anxieties, their insecurities, their worries, their head trash, their mind stuff, whatever. Because every executive I know has to do their inner work as well. And so I want you to understand that while that personality is very prevalent still in corporate, if you are willing 
to stand in that space with them and not internalize all that energy. It's not about you. Not be offended and wait until they're done puffing their smoke and puffing their chest up to hold them in a space of deep accountability and meet them eye to eye. Those can be some of the most amazing transformations in relationship that you can create. And so I say that because while I call them the overconfident, arrogant, egomaniac, many of them actually can turn into the fourth personality I'm going to share with you, which is my favorite, and I'll get to that in just a moment. Many of them just need a safe space to land. They need a container that can hold them. And when I think about light workers and healers, who better equipped to create containers to hold someone to do their own inner work? Wow, talk about an opportunity, right? So there's an opportunity just from a coaching perspective. And then there's opportunities for training and other things that we can create. So that is the first type of personality. That's the big one. The second personality that we get is what I will call chicken little. This is the what if people that think the sky is falling no matter what. Oh my God, we're going to go under. Oh my God, the pandemic hit. Oh my God, what are we going to do now? Oh my God, we're going to have to lay everybody off. Oh my God, we didn't hit our, hit our number. Oh my God, like everything is doomsday. And there is a handful of those people that live in corporate as well. And so one of the opportunities is to help them move out of that what if space. And I work with people a lot on letting go of the what if, oh my God, the sky is falling, doomsday is happening, and move into an imagine if space where they can tap into being creative and using their imagination. So sometimes it's as easy as helping them shift when they say, well, what if this fails? is to say, so let's talk about the opposite side of that as well. What if it succeeds? Imagine if, and then I will change language and say, so now that maybe it's succeeding, let's play that out a little bit. Imagine if instead of this failing, it actually succeeds. Talk to me about how, you, how that would build out. Imagine if, and give me another example. Imagine if, and so I do this on a lot of my training calls with corporate, where I will actually ask them, especially when we're talking about resiliency or we're talking about ways that they need to show up because leadership is a choice and it's everyone's opportunity. It's a space where I will ask them, I'm like, okay, and we talk about destroy the noise, which is one of the other things I teach a lot uh, because corporate likes their acronyms, they like their frames, they like their ways to have a formula, you know, and so destroy the noise is one of those spaces. Um, but when we talk about um, the what if scenario that's in the negative self-talk that creeps in, um, I will actually have someone role model. I'll pull them through in the conversation and say, okay, so somebody give me like the worst what if right now. And somebody's like, what if we fail? Okay. So right now I want you to think about the, the 180 easy opposite of what if we fail. Someone's like, okay, well, what if we succeed? And of course they're still in that energy. And I'm like, great. So let's change the language of that. And let's say, imagine if, we succeed. Now I want you to give me four more imaginifs. Imagine if you succeed, now what? And it's crazy, and I do five total for a reason, because when they get to three, they actually have to start thinking about it. So for example, people might say, well, imagine if we succeed. Okay, great. Imagine if we succeed so much that we actually create an environment where we need to hire more people. Ooh, that feels a little bit different. Imagine if we're succeeding so well that we can actually invest and create more opportunities to develop our people so that our culture becomes richer. And then like that third, at that third level, the energy starts to shift. And people then start like really getting expansive and really allowing themselves to play in their imagination around what's possible. It's so crazy how having that conversation with someone who's a chicken little, oh my God, always looking. By the way, your chicken littles oftentimes are your accountants, they're your finance people, they're your engineers, and they're your IT people. People that have a very linear way of thinking tend to be more chicken little. They're always looking for where something's going to fail. When you can help them play in their creativity and allow them more of a linear process that allows them the exploration of possibilities, you actually can create opportunities where there might not have been, been an opportunity before. So you actually have the opportunity to help them be like, holy crap, I never thought that was possible. And then because they've got that linear brain, they start looking at how all those pieces could fit and what they could do. And now they're on board to do more. So just know that while that first personality is, a, is more around that kind of 
overconfident, arrogant egomaniac. The second personality, and a lot of times this shows up for your very analytical, your linear people that always need things black and white, your high C's in the organization, for those of you that do disc work, um, they're your conscientious people, they're your cautious people, um, they're, they're your accountants, they're your engineers. Now, not to say there won't be other people like that. They tend to be more of the chicken little. So they need to see things in a different perspective. This is where you can share statistics that open up and imagine possibilities. Imagine if we could do those same things with your organization. Imagine if, based on what we're seeing in the industry, this is happening. Imagine if you could do twofold that. Imagine you can start playing in how their linear brain works and start creating a new equation for them. And I talk a lot with people because I do work a lot with, I'm a mechanical engineer by background. For those of you that don't know, I know shocking. I don't feel or seem like an engineer, but I am at least by degree. I am a mechanical engineer, so I can speak geek and chic. It is one of my skill sets, which means I can speak to the linear analytical people in an organization, technical people. And I can speak to those that are in sales that like to have more, you know, expansive, bigger conversations. Uh, many of you have that skill set as well. Uh, either way, you're letting them play in what they can create, what equations they can put together. But I do a lot of work around analogies in equations because it connects, especially for the chicken little people. What if? So here's the other thing that I talk about with people. Here's an example of a what if. People are like, yeah, what if we fail? And I'm like, what if it's the wrong equation? And they're like, what? And so here's an example that I use a lot is I'll say, and I always say this mathematically, not spiritually or physically, philosophically, because I would argue this totally differently um, or debate this differently if we were talking philosophically or spiritually. Mathematically, what's one plus one? And I get people look at me crazy. I'm like, I'm not trying to trick you. Mathematically, one plus one equals what? And some of you that are on, feel free to play. One plus one equals what? It's not a trick question. Mathematically, what is one plus one equals what? Last I checked, it equals two. Okay. What is the square root of four? Also two. What is 298 minus 296? Also two. Right there, there are three ways to get to two. And mathematically, we've been taught that there is an infinite array of numbers available to us. So then wouldn't that also make sense that there's an infinite way to get to two? So you're so worried about failing because you're trying to do one plus one is two. What if you fail, but it actually opens up opportunity to realize that that's not the right equation for you. I think about when Thomas Edison was interviewed and he said, people said, how did it feel to fail 10,000 times before you figured out the light bulb? He's like, I didn't fail 10,000 times. I only found 10,000 ways it doesn't work. Perception, when we can help them change that perspective and realize that there are infinite ways to get to two and they've been so caught up in that two's their answer because that's what everybody else is doing, their competition's doing, they're faced on two. They forgot that there's an infinite number of numbers that maybe the outcome's two, three, four, or a million and 27. When you can help an engineer see that, it's crazy what's possible. I've done this multiple times in conversations with those people that are chicken little. And I have a couple different analogies I use in that that are really powerful. One of those being that equation. So then the third personality that shows up is what I will call dazed and confused. This is the person that looks like they've got, they've been caught, the deer caught in the headlights. They are overwhelmed. They are just truly in survival mode and they are doing everything just to stay upright. They're probably well past burnout. Some of these people might have multiple personalities, just so you know. You might have a little bit of the overconfident ego and a little bit of the chicken little. You might have a little bit of chicken little and dazed and confused. Just know that you may have, they may be multi-personality people that you're engaging with, but there is a space of dazed and confused. There's a space of, I don't know which way's up. And I hear that all the time. I knew that I felt that a lot when I was in corporate. I'm just completely trying to get through this day. I am just numb. I don't know what's going on. Point me in the right direction. I can remember at one point, I was dazed, dazed and confused for sure. When I was traveling like a crazy person, I was traveling about 70% of the time. I would leave on Sunday nights or Monday mornings. I'd be in three different time zones in a week. I wouldn't get back till fr late Friday night. I would spend Saturday getting caught up on things and then I would redo that again. And I can remember at one point I had been on the East Coast, I'd been West, I'd been back up to Milwaukee and then I was going out. And I was flying to Salt Lake City. I was working with a client out there when I was back. I think this was my, was this my G, I think it was my GE days. 
Um, it might have been my JCI days, my Johnson Controls days. Either way, I was traveling too much in both jobs. But I was traveling, and I can remember I was in like five different cities and three different time zones in a week. And I remember getting to the hotel because I literally just had people kind of like usher me into a car that got on a plane that I just went and did work and didn't know where I was going, right? So I remember getting into the uh, reception area, the lobby, and I remember going, do you have a reservation for me? And the woman's like, of course, yes. And I was like, can you tell me what city I'm in and what time zone it is? And she just looked at me and like, I'm like, I have no idea where I'm at. I knew there were mountains. So I'm like, I'm thinking I'm somewhere west. Um, I really had no idea. I just kept moving at the space where I was just dazed and confused. I was just like, show me where I need to go. And then I just got on kind of autopilot where I was just doing what I needed to be doing to help close deals because we were going to a hospital the next day to work on closing an account. Um, and then I got back on a plane and did the same thing. So it was that space of you've got some people that are so busy, they're so overwhelmed that they're just in a space of dazed and confused. When you can help ground them, again, light workers and healers, your grounding work, when you can help bring them back to a center, when you can help them get clarity around what is opportunity for them and how to clear out some of the excess you become highly valuable. And so there's conversations you can have to help that dazed and confused person reclaim a little bit of their life, right? And like I said, some of these people can have multi-personalities. So then the last personality, this is my all-time favorite. Now, some of the three types of personalities that I just shared with you have an opportunity to be moved into this fourth opportunity. Sometimes you just get lucky and this fourth time, and I will tell you, this is the part that gets me excited about why so many of you need to take your message to corporate right now because more and more of these leaders are showing up. More and more of these leaders are like poking their head up. More and more of these leaders are using their voice to be heard and more and more of these leaders get it. And the fourth type is what I call the ray of sunshine. These are the heart-centered leaders that get it. Not I got it, but they get it. They get it. They see where they're lacking. They see where there's opportunities. They want to put their people first. They believe in personal development and growth. They believe in culture. They believe in loving the shit out of their people. And they want to bring in the tools and the resources to elevate their people to the next level. And I will tell you, it is one of the most beautiful things to see. I have companies that I have been working with in those three other spaces that all of a sudden a new breed of leaders and some of them being leaders that I have been so blessed to be helping grow through their own development over the last five, six years that are now in positions to be the leaders who are overseeing these cultures, these markets, these areas, that because they get it, because they've been doing that work, because they're ready, they now are like, Candy, let's, let's do something really meaningful. And I am in a position right now to be co-creating with them things that we've never ever done things that I could only dream of doing in the corporate space and it is things that are addressing healing and energetic work and courageous conversations and self-care and it's the ability to allow people safe containers to be more vulnerable to show them what a safe container looks like let them experience it and then teach them how to create those containers themselves so much opportunity in that space and those ray of sunshines they are the best champions they are the people that like get it they are the people that may forgo a promotion because they want to keep making sure that they're creating legacy within the, the space that they started to do the work they're the people that are invested they show up with their people and i will tell you these used to be a smattering back when I started my business and definitely when I was in corporate. And there are more and more and more rays of sunshine coming to the surface. And so I say that because even some of those overconfident, arrogant, egomaniac personalities, when you lean in the right way, when you create the container that allows them to feel safe, when you open up possibilities, some of them can be moved into that space of what I call ray of sunshine. So those four personalities that are really prevalent, and again, you might find people that have multiple personalities, and I've given you kind of a, some, some opportunity to understand those personalities and some things you might do to help navigate those conversations. I also want to invite, for those of you that are really serious about taking your message into bigger spaces, you know you're being called that you need to have bigger reach, bigger impact. 
Corporate is the space to do that. I want you to realize there's $350 billion in training in the corporate space. There is a lot of resources available and there is a lot of opportunity. It is also truly no better time for you to be taking your message in and they need you. I keep, it, it is so absolutely clear so that if you are interested, please um, tell me, yes, I want more information, put crack the code, whatever. Um, the incubator I'm running to help you workshop these things um, starts July 13th. It's a six-week incubator. If you are interested, please either PM me or put crack the code below so that I can get you the information. Again, this is for people that are ready to roll up their sleeves, invest in your business to do the work so that you can create that bigger impact um, and understand how to engage and have these conversations and create the tools and templates you need um, to support that. So I say that because I'm, I'm really being called that I'm here to help others get access in this space um, because our message is needed. It is absolutely needed. And so I want you to realize that those four personalities, the overconfident, arrogant, egomaniac, those that have that chicken little kind of mentality or personality, the dazed and confused, and my favorite, the ray of sunshine, they all exist in that space. And some of them, again, might have some per multi-personalities. And when you have the right language, when you have the right tools, when you understand and can spot and identify those people, you actually can navigate a very powerful conversation that can open up access for a lot of possibilities, for a lot of opportunities. Um, it's just recognizing that, okay, that's that mask they're wearing. That's a personality. How do I get into that and meet them where they're at? And I love, I have a friend that says this all the time, meet people where they're at and lift them to where you want them to go. And so when you understand and you can see the signs of, ooh, this is someone protecting themselves right now with a mask that says, I got this. I'm going to buckle up. I'm going to puff up. Okay. Let them puff up and wait till the air comes out. And then allow myself to lean in and ask some really pointed questions. And so on the next Facebook Live I'm going to do this week, we're going to talk about the five components of how to activate a really deep connection on an initial call. While I'll go through the five uh, elements. And again, this is part of what I will be sharing and you will be workshopping in the incubator if you are interested. So for those that are interested, those that are ready, uh, just let me know. Reach out to me. Either let me know in the thread or, um, and for those of you watching the replay later, or let me know by PMing me and saying, yes, please, I want more information about how to um, be part of the incubator that is launching July 13th. And so um, it's going to be really powerful. Um, there's a lot of really cool stuff in it, and it will help you walk through an entire opportunity to get your message into those bigger spaces. So with that, everybody, any questions, any comments before I wrap up? For today, hopefully that was helpful. I am just trying to give you um, some different lenses and different tools uh, for those of you that really are ready to take your message in bigger ways, create bigger impact. By the way, these personalities show up in other places besides corporate. And so when you know that um, and you know how to address them, it just makes you that much stronger. Um, so I don't see any questions. Thank you for the comments, ladies. I see those on there. Um, you all are awesome as well. And uh, just know I'm here. I love you. And that now is the time uh, to activate and amplify our messages in bigger spaces to create greater impact for more people. So with that, loving you all. And uh, I will see you back here at Facebook Live. I think it's on Thursday. So with that, everybody, have a great day.